When everything around us seems to be crashing down, can we stand firm? Yes, we can, and yes, we will. Our sermon text this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, help us this day to learn from your word by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may stand firm and have victory for the sake of your kingdom, and in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, on the evening of January 8th, 2008, electrified crowds were hanging on every word of the speech, hoping that this man might bring unity and victory. They were standing firm with him. And then he spoke these words. When we've faced down impossible odds, when we've been told that we're not ready or that we shouldn't try or that we can't, generations of Americans have responded with a simple creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. You may or may not remember that. That was President Barack Obama. Not endorsing him, just quoting him. But Philippians 4 is all about unity and victory for the most important body in the whole universe, the body of Christ, the church. And this morning, Paul will teach us that in order to have victory, we must stand firm in unity. Stand firm. And in order to stand firm in unity so that we might have victory, scholars have mentioned that we have various keys to standing firm in Philippians chapter 4. And I want to find seven of those here this morning in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. This morning being the first anniversary of the founding of King's Cross Reformed Church, I thought that these keys might serve as a proper encouragement and exhortation as you begin your second year boldly here in Austin, Texas. But before we dive into these seven keys to standing firm, let's read verse 1, which makes it clear that we have a command from Paul to stand firm. Let's read verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. You may have noticed Paul starts his pa passage out by saying, therefore. And kids, do you know what you're supposed to do when you see a therefore? You're supposed to see what it's there for. And so we need to see what came right before this. And so let's read what Paul said right before this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Because Paul often gives a truth, and then he says, therefore, you must act this way. Here's the truth. Now do this. Let's read Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You see that when he said, you are citizens of heaven. Now let's get the context here. Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. And Philippi is a city who had its mother city. The word for that in Greek is metropolis. A metropolis is a mater, mother, polis, city. And his, the mother city of Philippi was Rome. This means that the people of Philippi considered themselves to be Roman citizens. Indeed, they were citizens of Rome. And they were tasked with going to Philippi, living in Philippi, and making Philippi look more and more like its mother, Rome. Those citizens of Rome had no plans ever to move over to the overcrowded capital of Rome itself. Rather, they were to bring Rome to Philippi. And it's in this context that Paul tells these Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. And from heaven, we wait here in Philippi for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming from heaven. And when he does, he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious, resurrected, immortal, hyper-physical, hyper-spiritual body. This is what Paul is saying. The truth that he's revealing is that one day Jesus will come and he will transform us to be like him when he brings the new heavens and the new earth where death is no more. Okay, so that's the truth that Paul is laying out here. You may be citizens of Buda or of Austin in the state of Texas 
You're citizens of the United States of America, but brethren, above all that, you are citizens of heaven. And you are citizens of heaven because you are supposed to bring heaven to San Antonio, oh, San Antonio, to Austin and Buda. Because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so, Paul has told us this is the truth, and now he's going to tell us what we need to do in order to build a church, and in order that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Paul has told us a truth that is a future, that's not yet here. So now, we need to get working toward that future. And Paul tells us what we need to do here in verse 1. What do you need to do? Stand firm in unity. So how do we stand firm in unity? Well, first, in order to stand firm in unity, we have to be open to help. Be open to help. Let's read verses 2 through 3. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Here, Paul gives us some interesting specifics, right? We get a window into the world of that church in Philippi. And what we see is there's these two women. And surprise, surprise, they're not getting along. That never happens in church, does it? They have some kind of falling out, and they can't seem to work it out among themselves. It turns out that this happens at times in most, if not all, churches. So we shouldn't be surprised when we have problems. You shouldn't be surprised here at King's Cross if from time to time people aren't getting along. That's normal. Even here in St. Paul's Church in Philippi, there is disunity. And disunity threatens the victory of the church. So watch out for it and deal with it. And so what does Paul do? He calls upon, see there, I entreat you, true companion, true companion to help. And that word true companion in the Greek is loyal Sisychus. That's what it sounds like. And we don't know. It possibly was actually someone's name. His name was Sisychus. Or it could be a title, this man who's a companion. But either way, that word Sisychus in the Greek means burden bearer or yoke bearer. This church member, this true companion, is being called upon to help these ladies to reconcile. Paul is asking him to bear the burden, to bear the yoke of these ladies, and to help them agree. We know all too well that good Christians, brothers and sisters, will at some times rub each other the wrong way. We say or do something offensive, either intentionally or unintentionally, and they come to a point where there's disunity. We've all experienced it. And if we are going to stand firm in the church, Paul says we need to be open to help. You might need help. And this can mean either being open to give that help to people who aren't agreeing, or it can be meaning being open to receiving that help like these two women here that are at odds in Philippi. So the first key to standing firm is be open to help. The second key is found right there at the end of verse 3. I just read it where it says, whose names are in the book of life. These people's names who are at odds, these people in Philippi, Paul is convinced that their names are in the book of life. So the second key to standing firm in unity is to have confidence of your position in Christ. We are to be confident of our position in Christ. So what can these believers in Philippi be confident of? That they are saved. Paul says, you are saved. Your names are written in the book of life. They are accepted by Christ and they are in Christ. Well, think about this. If you, each one of you, can be confident that you are in Christ, then you can afford to let the chips fall where they may. And you can stand firm. This should be a great comfort to all of us. If you are baptized and you do the things that God requires of you, like participating here in the weekly covenant renewal service, by tithing, by submitting to church discipline, then you have every single reason to be assured and confident of your position in Christ. 
Isn't that a great reassurance for you here this morning? This is really good news, brethren. There are no supreme works, no supreme works that you need to do in order to secure your name in the book of life. That work has already been done for you. You may at times think or feel like you don't belong, but Paul tells us to ignore that, that we can be confident of our position in Christ. In Christ, you are in the book of life. So far, we've been told that in order to stand firm in unity, we need to be open to help, and we need to be confident of our position in Christ. Verse 4 reveals that third, we need to celebrate continually. Celebrate continually. Let me read verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. What does it mean to rejoice? Well, it means to fill yourself with joy. To fill yourself with joy. And what does filling yourself with joy do? Think about this. What happens when you fill yourself with joy, particularly joy in Christ? Think about times when you've realized that once again. Well, the first thing it does is it drives out pride. It drives out pride because the joy that you have isn't anything that you have done for yourself, but rather it's joy in what Jesus has done for you. Think about that. What Jesus has done for you. What has Jesus done for you? Well, if we look back at Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, Paul puts pretty clearly that Jesus, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. By being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what Jesus has done for you. Jesus, in his humility, gave his life for ours. And because of this, we have resurrection life. That is why we rejoice in the Lord always. Joy in Christ drives out pride. And watch out. Watch out because the opposite is also true. Pride can drive out your joy. If you think too much of yourself, you'll forget that it's all about Jesus and what he has done for you, and you'll lose your joy in Christ. Are you lacking in joy this morning? Do you sometimes suffer from lack of joy? Well, remind yourself. Don't ever forget. Remind yourself what Jesus has done over and over again, and you will be filled with joy in Christ. Joy that drives out pride. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. Okay, so the first key of standing firm in unity is to be open to help. Second, be confident of your position in Christ. Third, celebrate continually. And the fourth key shows up in verse 5. Put up with people. Put up with people. Let's read verse 5. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now, the Greek word there translated as reasonableness is epiekes, and it can be translated in a number of ways. Patient, yielding, tolerant, courteous, kind. And implicit in all of these definitions is the practice of restraint. Practice restraint. Paul is telling us, put up with people. Which people? Did you notice? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Everyone. Now, that's a pretty big challenge, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to be reasonable with reasonable people. But Paul says here, put up with everyone. But how can we possibly put up with everyone? Well, Paul answers this question, too. He says, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. At the time of Paul's writing this letter, to say that the Lord is near had a couple of different senses. First and foremost, putting up with the Jews and the Judaizers who were persecuting Paul, they're persecuting the early church, that would have been a great challenge. How do you put up with these people who are persecuting you? But, Paul tells him, the Lord's near. And the Lord was near. 
In A.D. 70, he vindicated the church by using Rome to destroy the temple and Jerusalem. And he's confirming in that action that Jesus had come and that he had brought with him new creation. So vindication is near in the midst of your persecutions. The Philippians can put up with persecution because the Lord was at hand and the Lord was about to take care of them. But in another sense, the Lord is near is always true. The Lord is always at hand. He's here this morning and each Sunday morning when we come to worship him at the covenant renewal service. That is a promise for the church at all times. The Lord is always near and that's a promise to you. You may have, you may have to put up with some odious and touchy people inside and outside the church, but the Lord is near and the Lord will take care of you. The Lord will take care of it. Now, this doesn't mean that you let people walk all over you. Paul isn't telling us to be weak. We do need to confront sin wherever it happens and to call for repentance in love. But Paul tells us that our attitude needs to be that of patience, of gentleness, while those around us, and maybe even we ourselves, are being dealt with by the Lord who is near. He'll deal with it. So put up with people. Have you ever been around someone who just can't be happy unless immediate justice is meted out. This attitude is common among children, isn't it? But I think if we admit it to ourselves, it's pretty common among us adults as well. But the thing is, that's not our job. Paul doesn't tell us to only let our reasonableness be known to those who are reasonable. Be reasonable to those whom you want justice meted out right now, and it's not fair if it doesn't. The desire for complete and immediate justice will make it impossible for you to put up with people and make it impossible to then stand firm in unity. And in particular, if we can't put up with people here in the church and we can't stand firm in unity, we won't have victory. So put up with people and trust that the Lord is at hand. So the key is to standing firm. So far, be open to help. Be confident in your position in Christ. Celebrate continually. Put up with people. And fifth, give your anxiety to God. Give your anxiety to God. Let's read verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Give your anxiety to to God. This is easy to say, not so easy to do, right? Well, verses 6 and 7 give us kind of a step-by-step -step process to eliminate anxiety in your life. First, you pray. When you have anxiety, pray. You pray to God and it says you make a supplication. Kids, that word supplicate means that you ask God to take care of your problem. You don't try to fix it yourself. You give it to God. Because... He can take care of it, can't he? Can he take care of your problems? Remember Jesus' words in Luke 11, 1. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead he give a fish that he will give a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Jesus can answer your prayers. So ask that God would take care of the problem. And then notice you're supposed to also do it with thanksgiving. You're supposed to thank him that he can take it off of your shoulders. Let your requests be made known to God. It's not like he doesn't know them already. But brethren, throughout Scripture, if we know one thing, it's God loves to listen to his people when they wrestle with him. He loves to have them request so that he can answer those requests. But what if you've done this before and you're still anxious, right? That's probably happened to you before. I know it's happened many times to me. I've done this process. I've done this step by step exactly as Paul laid it out. And what happens? I'm still anxious. So what are you supposed to do? Do it again. You're supposed to do it again. Pray and ask God to take care of the problem and then thank him for taking that problem off your shoulders. And it may take some time, but if you persevere in this, this is a spiritual discipline, you will have the peace of God. And it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I know this from experience. You hopefully do as well. Spiritual disciplines are like 
physical disciplines. You have to persevere in and through them. As you young kids say, if you want to be yoked, you physically strong, you have to do exercise and you have to do it with discipline. If I want to be spiritually or mentally strong, you have to be disciplined in it. You have to do it and do it again and do it again. So persevere, brethren. Prayer plus supplication plus thanksgiving equals peace. That is a promise from God. Give your anxiety to God. The sixth key then is to, the fifth key, I'm sorry, is to give your anxiety to God. So the sixth key to standing firm is to think the best of others. Think the best of others. Let's read verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Well, Paul here gives us a list of eight things about which we should think. And where do we find these eight things? Well, we do find them all over the place, don't we? We find them in music. We find them in art. We find them in history. And most obviously, we find them by meditating on Scripture. But certainly, the most common place in day-to-day -day life that we find these things is in people. It's in each other. And if we can think about people we know both inside and outside the church, we can likely find at least one and probably more of these eight things exhibited in their lives. If we go back to verse 2, remember we have Euodia and we have Syntyche. What if these women had spent a little bit of time thinking about which of these qualities are exemplified in each other? Perhaps that might bring about the unity that can cause them to stand firm. Maybe if you and I, if we here at King's Cross spent more time considering how we might think about the ways those of us around us are true and honorable and so on, we might find ourselves more united. And thus we would be more effective at standing firm and seeking the victory of the kingdom of God. So think the best of others. The keys to standing firm, be open to help, be confident of your position in Christ, celebrate continually, put up with people, give your anxieties to God, think the best of others, and then finally, the seventh key to standing firm is to imitate those people who demonstrate the virtues we just looked at. Imitate people who demonstrate these virtues. Let's read verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I suppose a goal of each Christian could be that by the end of their life, he could say this very command himself. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things. I know if I'm honest, I personally can't say this of myself yet. I can say practice some of these things, and hopefully tomorrow I can say there'll be even more of them, but not all of them. And so I, I need to look around me and find people whom I can imitate because they demonstrate the virtue that I myself don't have yet but need to practice. A proud person never imitates. You know why? Because he doesn't need to, or so he thinks. He has nothing to learn. He's self-sufficient. But a humble person, a humble person recognizes the strengths of others and imitates them. So look around you this morning. It's kind of an uncomfortable sometimes when a pastor asks you, but at least in your mind, look around those. Consider those that are here this morning around you. Think about how they might be people worth imitating. Can you think, I want to be like her in that way. I want to be like that guy in that way. I've learned and received and heard and seen things in these people, and I want to practice these things too. And the promise here, you'll notice in verse 9, is that if we do this, not just the peace of God, but the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace is with those who do these things. And you will be able to stand firm in unity so that Jesus and his church will have victory. 
And that's why we're here at King's Cross, isn't it? How can King's Cross stand firm in unity this next year and throughout its years? Be open to help. Be confident of your position in Christ. Celebrate continually. Put up with people. Give your anxiety to God. Think the best of others and imitate people who demonstrate these virtues. In ice hockey, if a player commits a foul that's egregious enough to warrant a penalty, what happens? He's placed into the penalty box for either two or five minutes. And during that time, the opposing team has a numerical advantage called a power play, where one team has fewer players and is in great danger of being scored upon. And in order for this team to make it through these minutes, they must stand firm in unity. Brethren, it may seem at times that we, the church, are at a numerical disadvantage against the forces of hell. But the truth is, truth is that it's not even close. Their best player is stuck in the penalty box. We are citizens of heaven with King Jesus reigning and ruling and using his church to put all things under his feet where he's reigning right now in heaven. So King's Cross, stand firm. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. Give us the desire to practice the things that we have learned and received and heard and seen this morning in your word so that we might together stand firm in unity so that your kingdom will have victory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.